Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We want to say a word of welcome to all that are here today. Thank you for coming and being in person for us in worship. And also for those of you that are streaming on YouTube and Facebook, we welcome you and hope that you will join us soon. Uh, we do want to remind everybody that we have Connect cards if this is your first time being with us in worship or the first time in a while. Fill that out and let us know how we can be in touch and let you know about what's happening in the life of the church. And there are uh, prayer cards on the flip of that. If you will flip those cards over and use those for uh, sharing prayer concerns to be put in the bulletin. Uh, right after this service today, we have a very brief called charge conference. It'll be just here down front in the sanctuary. Everybody's welcome to stay, and all members of the church uh, get to vote at charge conference. Uh, we'll just be uh, addressing one item. Uh, it will, shouldn't take more than 10 minutes. Uh, also, at 5 o'clock this afternoon, there's a game group that's going to be meeting in the meeting room across from the church office. So come if you want to gather and... Uh, Throw down with some good competitive and uh, fun fellowship and games. That'll be at 5 o'clock for all the ages. Next Sunday, we have new members joining the church. and We want to invite anyone that is to the place of wanting to make that commitment of faith uh, to join with them. If you'd let me know that uh, this week, early in the week, we can arrange that so that you can be a part of that as well. And then Mike Drum, our staff parish chair, has a quick announcement to make. Um, Mike, come stand over there where a mic is so everybody can hear you. Mike, stand up to the mic. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Next Sunday is, uh, is a, a good day, but it's a very sad day. We're gonna, Mark will be his last Sunday. We're really sad to hear, have him go, but we are really, really proud to have him here. Uh, we're going to have a luncheon right after. It's just going to be hot dogs. and. Mm -hmm chips and baked beans and peach cobbler and just uh, just to celebrate the eight years Mark's been here. We want everybody to be here if you can just to show your appreciation to Mark. Thank you. That be that be immediately following the service. Mark Mark close your ears. <laughs> Today and next Sunday, we'll be taking up a love offering for Mark. So if you feel it in your heart, give to it. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, be sure to mark that as love offering. Don't put your regular offering in the plate uh, for that because you need to continue to support uh, the church first and foremost uh, through your offering and tithes and gifts. Well, we're going to stand and sing together a great hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Uh, if you'll stand together, the words will be on the screen and we'll sing.
the uh, peace of Christ in our heart and love for one another, let's greet each other this morning. Take a few moments. You should begin to make your way back to your places now so that we can continue with worship. Please take your places and we'll continue with worship this morning. Yeah, let's make our way back to our seats, folks. Thank you. Yes, um, <laughs> back to your pews, let's go. Oh. You may be seated if you'd like to. Our praise team is on vacation, and so we have a soloist this morning and will for the rest of the month of June. Larry's going to sing two pieces that are familiar to you, and although you're seated, and although he's all by himself, we invite you and encourage you to sing along with us if you'd like to. This I Believe and King of Kings. Our 
our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Praise the Father, praise the Son. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. The gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three. Yes, thank you very much, Larry. Good job on singing those songs and leading us. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and I see a few of you wore red. Uh, that was the invitation to you all, and uh, thanks for, for coming uh, decked out and dressed out. I have no red attire other than a Christmas tie, and I figured that was not appropriate in June. So I decided to wear my robe and the color red, uh, the stole, which I'm wearing today. So I'm going to read the account of Pentecost. And it's called Pentecost, you may know, because it occurred 50 days after Jesus' resurrection from the grave. And on that day, which you'll hear, uh, a promise that Jesus made to his disciples uh, came to pass. From Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest upon each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem at that time, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one had heard their own language being spoken. They were utterly amazed, and they asked, Aren't these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and all the parts of Libya near Cyrene, <coughs> visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they must have had too much wine to drink. 
Then Peter stood with the eleven disciples and uh, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. And he said, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you have supposed, for it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel long ago, who said, In the days of the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Upon your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will see dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so Peter continues his sermon, saying, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. And this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of, of evil men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But Jesus raised him from, but God raised Jesus from the dead, uh, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said long ago about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, and I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices, and my body also rests in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, and you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence. After Peter had finished reading from that psalm, he said, Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this very day. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place some of his descendants upon the throne. And seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. And God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said this, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, and when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter said to the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far away, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, Peter warned them and pleaded with them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted the message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And that is the story of Pentecost and the sermon of Peter. And it is the word of God for the people of God today. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. Do we have any children in the house today? Any kids? Yeah, come on down. I've got a little lesson, object lesson for y'all. Yay, Bennett and Hazel Grace are here. Any others? No?
glad to have you two coming to be with us. Come on and have a seat. Good to see you today. How are you? How do you like my red stole? Pretty good? It is pretty neat. All right, I brought something from my kitchen today. It's honey. And what's it, um, what's it in the shape of? A bear. It's called a honey bear. Do you know why? Because bears like honey to eat. Did you know that? Yeah. Yep. Bears love to eat honey. That's, that's why there's honey in that. And do you know what makes honey? What did you say? Bees do. That's right. And honeybees are little yellow bees that have black stripes. Do you know that? Do you know what they do this time of year, the honeybees, when they go out in the morning of their home? No, they don't just play. They work. They work hard. They, throughout the day, fly from flower to flower. Have you ever seen a bee before that goes to the middle of the flower? No? If you look closely and you see a bee in the garden or in the flower bed, you will see a bee go to the middle of the flower. What is a bee doing in the middle of a flower? No? Not collecting honey. It's collecting something powdery. It's called pollen. Have you ever heard of pollen? It's dust. But they collect that all day long and they go back to their home and they leave the pollen there. Why would they take dusty pollen back to their home? You know, because they're going to make what there? They're going to make honey out of that pollen. Isn't that amazing? Look at this picture. Hazel Grace, do you see that? Those are honeybees. And do you, this is their home. Do you know what that's called? It's called a honeycomb. Isn't that pretty neat? Do you know that they make that home? And do you know that sometimes a, a beehive will have 50,000 honeybees in it? Isn't that amazing? That's a lot of bees. And many of them are out every day collecting pollen and bringing it back so they can make more honey. Do you know that the bees eat the honey? That's their food. They do. But do you know how much honey is usually left over in a very productive beehive after they've eaten what they want? 80 pounds of honey. Isn't, that's a lot of honey. This is maybe two or three pounds, but 80 pounds of honey they make. And that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? It is. So my point is this, that today we're, we're listening to and talking about uh, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus promised, and this is in John chapter 14, that God our Father in heaven will give to you another helper to be with you forever. And it's God's spirit of truth. And you will know him, and he will live with you and be inside of you. Did you know that God's spirit wants to dwell within our hearts? He does. And do you know what happens when we let God come and, and live within us, inside of us? We become more like God. And we're filled up with his goodness and all the things that Jesus showed us and taught us to do that, that God wants us to do. And so, really, our hearts are kind of like the beehive, and we can make honey and be sweet inside if we will just allow God to come in and make his home within us. Isn't that a great thing? It is. Uh, one thing that the Bible tells us um, is that God wants to help us to share his goodness with all the world. And we do that by inviting him to come live within us and following Jesus. So let's pray about that today, okay? Bow your heads with me. Uh, Y'all can repeat after me. You know how to do that in a prayer? Uh, dear Jesus, thank you. Uh, thank you for your Holy Spirit. And thank you for making us sweet inside like honey. Thank you for honeybees and for them making vegetables grow and for them taking all that pollen and taking it back to their beehive that we can have sweet honey to eat. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you all for coming down today. See you soon. I got to see several of you at the Coliseum last night. Uh, and some people that I hadn't seen in a long time. It was graduation for Southeast Senior High School. And um, we had two of our graduates graduate. And it was a, a very beautiful time. Always is to see great accomplishments. Uh, Abby and Abby are smart, I can tell you that. Uh, they, um, they showed that from, uh, from the program last night. Uh, they have studied hard and um, did much better in school than I did. I, I can tell you that much. But what a great night it was. Um, also, uh, Marsha O'Dell, who's in our choir. You've been singing in the choir over a year. Maybe not quite two. But she's moving this week back up to Ohio from where she's from to be closer to family. And uh, we wish you well. We thank you for your service to Christ through the church. And the choir is going to miss you. I know we are too. But uh, we will be praying for your safe travels and your settling there and being there. Uh -huh. Other prayer concerns or joys and celebrations that you would like to share today? None? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for all good things because they come from you. We thank you for the many simple blessings in life, and we thank you for, for big moments in life, such as graduations and uh, homecomings, uh, going back home again. We thank you for uh, big moments uh, spiritually, such as Pentecost. It is our birthday for the church, Lord, because we celebrate today your presence that has come to dwell among us and live within us. Thank you so much for, for that presence, the, the presence of your son Jesus, the, the presence of you, God our Father in heaven, and, and the fullness of, of you, God, that dwells within us is beautiful and sweet. We thank you for uh, the peace that passes all understanding that you give to us because of your presence with us. We thank you for the guidance that you provide through our conscience, by which your Holy Spirit speaks to us, promptings to do good and, and right and God things in the world, strength for difficult times and moments of, of temptation. Lord, your Holy Spirit goes with us, always and everywhere. And we are so thankful for that, and we celebrate you sending it to be with us at Pentecost. Lord, thank you for our church, and thank you for uh, the gift of faith, and thank you for the gathered believers that are here today, as they were on that first Pentecost. May your Holy Spirit come and move among us in a fresh way. Lord, help us as a church to always be thinking about where it is that you're calling us to and listening to how it is that you would have us to go. Lord, especially in times of transition, as I'm preparing to leave and as Pastor Kirk is preparing to come here, Lord, help your Holy Spirit to be the constant through it all and the strength and the inspiration to do greater things than even your Son Jesus who came to teach us just that. It's in his name today that we pray, Lord, and we offer this prayer because he taught his disciples to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, it's time for us to uh, receive our offering now, and 
believe Elizabeth is going to play, or no, the choir is going to sing an anthem. And uh, ushers, we invite you to uh, come forward and to uh, pass the plates among us. <coughs> Yeah, we're going to do the doxology, so you are going to stay up. All right, let's everyone stand. We'll sing together. Thank you, choir. Everyone can be seated now. <laughs> yeah, I've had someone ask before, why is it that the color for Pentecost is red? And that is because you heard the story of 
what appeared to be uh, tongues of fire falling upon the disciples that first Pentecost. Um, consequently, and you'll see this uh, on our hymnal on the front and, and on our church logo, there is a red flame entwined with the cross of Jesus. And that red flame represents the Holy Spirit and reminds us that we are to be about inviting God to be a part of our lives. Uh, for the gospel reading today, I'm reading from John 14, verses 8 through 17. And Jesus uh, teaching his disciples about experiencing the fullness of God. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered him, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And so how can you say, show to us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but rather it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. For very truly I tell you, whoever believe, believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do that to the glory of God. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give to you an advocate to help you and be with you forever. It is the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And that's the word of God for the people of God today. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord. For it is you and you alone that are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the fun things that I love about camping ministry, and we have one of our youth um, who is in college now working at Camp Tacoa as a camp counselor this summer, are, are the games that you get to lead the kids in playing when you're a counselor. I, I did that when I was in college. I went in the summers and worked at summer camp, church camp, and we got to play fun games with the kids of all ages. And one of those games I was thinking about this past week is called Darling If You Love Me. Does so anybody know this game? It may be familiar to you after I tell you how it's played. It begins with uh, everyone in the youth group at camp sitting in a circle together, and one person, one of the campers, being designated as it. And the it person goes and sits in the middle, and it's their turn. And they select one of the others in the circle that is their subject, and they go over to them, and they say, in order to make them smile, darling, if you love me, won't you please, please smile? Now, the point of the game is for the subject to resist that and to not smile, because that would mean then that they have to become it and then get in the middle of the circle and then choose a subject and make them smile. And so the point, after they are asked, the subject, is to say, darling, I love you but I just can't smile. Now you can imagine with a bunch of middle schoolers, right, that this is awkwardly funny and a little bit uncomfortable. And they're able, actually, in playing this game to touch 
one another just on the face and head, though, because it is church camp after all, right? <laughs> and so they will go over to them and say, Darling, if you love me, won't you please, please smile? And they're mussing their hair or they're tickling their ear to try to make them laugh. And the point is to try not to break and to simply say, I love you, but I just can't smile. And so Jesus says in the scripture today to his disciples, if you love me, here's what you'll do. And it's not just smile. Jesus teaches us today in this gospel lesson about experiencing the fullness of God. It is for our benefit, and he tells us how to do that because he's teaching his disciples how to do that. And the first of those is that he says, love me, love me. Darling, if you love me, love me more than everything else. John's gospel uh, is very unique among the four gospels because it paints things in dark and light shades very often. It contrasts things. And, and one of the things that Jesus contrasts here and how John explains that to us is the difference between the world and between heaven between the things of this world that we can love and we can follow and we can elevate and make our purpose of existence and, and chase after. And that is, in John's opinion, in opposition to putting God and Jesus first and chasing after the kingdom of heaven most of all. And that's why Jesus said when he was asked by one of his disciples, what is the most important teaching, Lord? And he said, first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to his disciples, love me, love me more than even the world in which you live. The world's not going to understand why you do that because it makes no sense to the human mind. That is about self-preservation and, and getting the things that we want and need in this life. But... Anyway, he says, love me above all things. Love me first. Well, what are the worldly things, I guess, that, that pull us away from, from following Jesus? And, and they're not bad things. They're gifts from God in many ways. And yet we can't allow them to have God-like status in our lives. It could be technology and communications these days with with, with smartphones and our obsession with that and being connected with people, it could be putting politics and the importance of, of our party or our candidate or, or people with our viewpoint being, being uh, in, in places of elevation and of power. A worldly thing can easily be convenience because there's a lot of times that, that we are supposed to do what Jesus calls us to do, to love him first, and yet it's not convenient with our schedule. It's not convenient with, with us getting along with other people. It's not convenient because it might mean standing up in opposition to something that, that we don't want to have to face the fire for. Convenience can easily be something of, of a worldly God if we will make it that. Entertainment is another as well. Just chasing after the things that we want and the things that, that make us happy and glad inside. You see, all of these are good things and they're all gifts from God, but, but they're nothing if we don't love Jesus above them. There, there's a lot of things that this world will promise to us, and I would say all of these worldly things that we put our, our faith and hope in, we we expect to get a sense of love and, and value back from. And that's okay, except they don't last forever. And they don't love us when, when everything else seems to go wrong. It's the love of God who has loved us first that Jesus calls us to put our hope and faith in. Jesus says, if you want to experience the fullness of God, love me. Love me more than the world. Second, he says, do what it is that I say to do. Follow me. 
Obey my commands. Uh, verse 12, very truly I tell you, he said, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And verse 13, if you love me, keep my commands. It's not much simpler than that, right? Just following what it is that Jesus has taught us to do. And yet we seem to complicate things, don't we? We do, we analyze things. I do this. Maybe you don't. I do. I can easily get paralyzed by analysis. Thinking too much about things instead of just doing what I, what I know is right and good and simple. And Jesus just lays that out very plainly for us. I remember in my 10th grade English class, I had a teacher named Mrs. Baxter. And Mrs. Baxter was a stickler for grammar of the English language. That was her job, to teach, you know, how to speak and write properly. And it's something to this day I value because uh, if I can put any kind of cohesive message together or say it, Logically, on Sunday, it's got to go back to Mrs. Baxter because she was quite a brute when it came to English grammar, I will tell you. Uh, she is one of those teachers that would just get, well, really passionate if she heard a verb spoken in the wrong tense or, or heard a, a participle that was dangling or an improper uh, usage of a pronoun. Um, I once had a, a teacher as a member of my church that on occasion would email me on Monday morning and, and just share with me uh, an instance where I had used something incorrect grammatically in my sermon. Now, I, I grew to appreciate that because she was very nice about it and kind about it, uh, and she was doing it, and uh, we joked about it, and I, I grew from that. But, but Mrs. Baxter was like a drill sergeant, instead of being nice about teaching us grammar and correcting us. Um, as uh, one of my classmates said in Mrs. Baxter's class, it's like being in English ROTC, because he was in ROTC um, in the afternoons. And I'll never forget on one of my papers that I turned in for assignment that she, she gave back to me, and she always used very generously a red marker on our English papers, circled them and pointed out what we did wrong, was about the word priority, because I used it in the plural. You know what I'm speaking of, priority being important, right? And I put priorities, I-E-S, as in plural. And I will never forget, and she taught me, uh, that the word priority cannot be plural, because by its very nature, it can mean only one thing above all the other things. And her comment was, Mr. Weekly, one mustn't speak or use a word of which they do not understand the meaning. And she put a smiley face behind it. Mrs. Baxter, we came to uh, joke about among our classmates, um, got the name the Grammar Hammer. <laughs> Mrs. Baxter, known as the Grammar Hammer at South Point High School, because she would lower the boom on somebody if they got their grammar wrong. Now, my point in sharing that story is simply this, that, that teachers are, are to instruct us and to teach us how to do right and good and, and to, to follow along properly, but not at the point of analysis where it discourages you and even defeats you before you even get started. And sometimes I'm afraid that we follow Jesus and we make it out to be too complicated, and it's not, and it's not supposed to be. It's simply a matter of knowing him, of knowing what it is that he said, and it's simply a matter of following him faithfully in, in all circumstances. That's important for us to do because there's a lot of things that will challenge living a life where we love our neighbor as ourselves, where we forgive others when they have done us wrong, uh, when we uh, give generously when others aren't giving back to us, uh, when we, we pray before a meal, when, when we're in a busy place and it doesn't seem convenient or make sense, 
There are just many, many things that Jesus calls us to do, and if we will just simply do them and not analyze them or question them to the point of paralysis, then we will find what it is that the fullness of God truly is. Uh, Jesus simply came to show us the way that leads to life, the fullness of life, an everlasting life. And he said, do what I say to his disciples. And last of all, he said, be open. Open yourselves up to the presence and power of God. And he's saying that, and I'm sharing this scripture today and preaching about this today because it's Pentecost Sunday, and Jesus ties together for us the fullness of God in the Trinity. Now, if you don't know, um, there's been much debate over thousands of years of the church questioning and wondering, wow, how do we understand God? What is our theology? How do we picture God and, and uh, really get a glimpse and understanding of who God truly is? And the Trinity is the predominant uh, understanding where we say there's one God, and yet, God is revealed to us in three ways. Jesus, in this scripture today, ties together the Father, himself, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in a way that is undeniably telling us that there is one God, and that Jesus is in the Father, and that the Holy Spirit is being sent by the Father, and that they are all together in one. Jesus teaches us and tells us what what we believe, that is, that the one true God is revealed to us in three ways that beautifully, fully give us an understanding of God's love and God's power and might. And we need to be open to that, Jesus says, through the Holy Spirit. This story of Pentecost is, is one not just about uh, great, amazing signs and wonders that happened that day, but it is about people being transformed by the Spirit of God that falls upon us and dwells within us. As I was telling the kids in our children's time today, that, that God can work within us and make us sweet on the inside, right? Yeah, we can be like a beehive in our hearts. We can, we can uh, make honey there, but, but not by our own volition and not just by doing the things that, that we want or that we think would be good but by seeking and following Jesus and allowing the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within us and, and to change and transform us into the likeness of Christ. That's what it means to allow the power and the presence of God to work within us. Where, where should we look for that Holy Spirit to be at work? It should be in the attitude, in the mindset, and and the love that we have towards others. And if we will follow Jesus, and he's very clear to say that, that you being obedient to what I call you to do and teach you to do directly affects how it is that the Holy Spirit works within you. Jesus says that if we will do that, we will experience fullness unlike any other way that is possible. Our own Methodist history, and John Wesley, who was the founder of Methodism, and a, and a short little stocky preacher from England, who people in the Church of England really had no use for and didn't want to listen to, he went out to places that were considered vulgar to share the gospel message and the good news of Jesus. Out at the coal mines, as miners were going down into the earth at shift change or coming back up, he would stand there. And he would share with them this good news of God's love for them and how God could change their lives. On street corners, where he was heckled and, and got vegetables thrown at him and other things. John Wesley was very bold in, in preaching his message of God's grace and how that can change our lives and the human heart. And he believed that God, if we will follow Jesus, will sanctify us within. And that means condition us to be more like, more like Christ. To allow the fruit of the Spirit to dwell up within us and come out. 
and to live a life that is expressed in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control as we read about in Galatians chapter 5. John Wesley said this about the Holy Spirit transforming us if we will allow him to come and dwell within. Uh, this is from his sermon, Scriptural Christianity. And uh, he preached, uh, In the fear then, and in the presence of the great God, before whom both you and I shall shortly appear, I pray that you are in authority over us, whom I reverence uh, for your office sake, uh, to consider, and not after the manner of disassemblers of God, uh, that you are filled with the Holy Ghost. Are you living portraits of him, meaning Jesus? Um, you who are appointed to represent the gospel among men. He is telling them and reminding them that the goal of the Christian life and the way to experience the fullness of God is to, to be open and invite in this Holy Spirit. God's presence to come and be with us. And it is full of benefit and full of love and full of peace and full of strength and full of courage. It is the indwelling of the living God who created the universe and the heavens and the earth, who sent his son into the world to show us how to live and, and died so that we might truly live through the gift of forgiveness and love and mercy and who raised him up from the dead and from the grave to overcome all things for us even death itself so that we can stand and say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because he's with me and he shall never leave me as I am faithful in following his son and so that is that is how to experience the fullness of God and Jesus makes it very simple for us and, and invites us, as he does every day, to, to tap into that source of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray together as we, as we prepare to close. Lord, you are um, able to do far more abundantly than, than all that we could ask or think of you. And, and your son Jesus said, if there is anything that we, we need to do or want to do to glorify you, that he would answer that prayer and give to us what it is that we need. Lord, according to uh, the power of your Holy Spirit, work within us. Help us to be familiar with your son Jesus. Help us to read his gospels and help us to, to strive to live and follow him faithfully. And Lord, by your Holy Spirit, give to us a confidence and a blessed assurance of knowing that, that you are with us and can help us in all things and through all things. This we ask, Lord, in, in the glory of uh, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, uh, as we close, I invite you to come down and... Uh, you can use the altar rail if you'd like to share prayer concerns with God or uh, invite him to come in and to be in your life in a new way. We're going to stand and sing as I invite you to do that. Number 369, Blessed Assurance. Yeah, the right words are on the screen this time. <laughs>
Everyone remember that we will uh, be having a quick charge conference down front of the sanctuary here uh, in just a few moments if you'd like to stick around. Uh, now as you go, uh, may you go in the power and in the presence of the Holy Spirit on this Pentecost Sunday. Know that um, it is the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the living God dwelling within you that enables you, that strengthens you, and that assures you of his love. Go in his peace. Amen. Amen.